On the 31st of January 1958, the US Army launched Explorer 1, an artificial satellite from a Jupiter-type sea rocket into orbit around the Earth. Explorer orbited the Earth at an average height of 1450 kilometers at a speed of 8 kilometers per second. In the program of the International Geophysical Year, it transmitted scientific information from a great height, practically speaking from space to the Earth, as the two Russian satellites Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2 had done previously. Sputnik and Explorer, however, were not merely instruments satisfying a desire for scientific knowledge. They became landmarks in the technical progress of the East and the West. All the artificial satellites and rockets have in common the laws which they must obey and the mathematical formula from which they are constructed. Such calculations were compiled for the first time in 1923 by Hermann Ober in his publication The Rocket to the Planet and into Space. This publication, a thesis, was rejected by scholastic sciences. It is now, however, one of the most famous works of world literature and earned its author the name of the father of rocket engineering and space navigation. Professor Hermann Obert was born in Hermannstadt in 1894, which at that time belonged to Austria-Hungary. Uh, when I was 11 years old, I read Jules Verne's book From the Earth to the Moon and The Trip to the Moon. I was first surprised that he wanted to diminish the speed of descent to the moon with the aid of rocket power. But I soon found out that the rocket is the only means of influencing a vehicle's movement in empty space. I also became convinced that his statement that a body would not return to the Earth if it were launched from the Earth's field of gravity at a speed of 11 kilometers per second was correct. I soon noticed that what he described of gunshot would not be possible. I thought about a number of possibilities to realize the project, and I finally ended up with the rocket. After that, I started to study the matter theoretically. I had little opportunity of making tests. At this time, I established the rocket theory, which had not existed up to then. The prerequisite of the rocket theory was the rule found by the English physicist Newton, according to which a vessel is thrust back with the same power with which a man jumps onto the shore moves forward. The power with which a jet of water leaves a narrow spray makes the tube itself move backwards. It is a principle which is also applied to gas. The escaping molecules of burning gas causes a back thrust in the blow lamp. Once the inertia of mass is overcome, speed is constantly increased while thrust remains the same. In addition, the blow lamp becomes constantly lighter as gasoline is burning away all the time. If we now imagine that we turn the blow lamp to 90 degrees, we have made a first step towards the rocket. The weight relation between the gas filled and the empty rocket is called mass relation. From this and the speed of escape it develops his famous basic rocket equation. With the aid of this equation, we can calculate the speed which a rocket will reach when it leaves gravity and air resistance. A modern liquid fuel rocket, like this American altitude research rocket Vanguard, which is as high as a six-story house, actually consists of three stages. In the upper tank of this first stage, which is the lowest, is liquid oxygen. There is no oxygen in space, and no combustion can take place without oxygen. In the lower tank is the fuel. It's a kind of refined gasoline with some additions. Helium gas from this container forces the oxygen and petrol to the centrifugal pumps, which move the fuel into the combustion chambers. There are no fuel pumps in the second stage. Here, Oxygen is carried as a chemical compound in the form of nitric acid, and the fuel is dimethyl hydrocin. The third stage is a solid fuel rocket. It carries the satellites. 
Just like a firework, it is filled with a compressed powder mixture. It is the most simple type of rocket and has the best mass relation. This project of a two-stage liquid fuel rocket, which Obert designed in 1912, is recognized today as the start of a new epoch. In 1923, however, his fundamental work on rockets was rejected. Well, I could tell many funny stories. The objection I most frequently heard was thrust would not be effective in space. Today, I needn't elaborate on this any further. The next objection was that cosmic speeds would be attained and that the fuel of the rocket would then be used up and it would not be possible to change its direction. The answer is that with a rocket, it is not intended to conduct the same kind of flights as with a plane. The flight of a rocket is rather like the throwing of an object from one roof to another. A further objection was that the fuels would not even contain sufficient energy to propel themselves beyond the gravity of the Earth. How could they lift the space rocket? We can reply that the rocket gas remains in the field of gravity of the Earth and that it merely pushes the rocket out of this field of gravity. From the principle of the multi-stage rocket developed by Obert, the following can be concluded. At the end of combustion of stage one, that is, when the fuel is used up, or when combustion of fuel is interrupted by remote control, the first stage has reached its maximum speed. The speed of the second stage, which is now burning, will now be added to the speed at which stage one reached at the end of combustion. After the elapse of a certain time, the third stage is ignited. It practically starts its flight with the speed the second stage had at the end of combustion. When the third stage is burnt out, the satellite flies through space without further impulse and at the sum of the speed of all the stages. Should the required speed not be reached after burning down of the last stage, then the projectile falls back to Earth, as did Pioneer 1, which was destined to reach the Moon. If, however, the speed is too high, the rocket passes the Moon and is then forced into an orbit around the Sun. That is what happened to a Russian rocket and also to the American rocket Pioneer 4 shortly afterwards. Although it is tremendously difficult to hit the Moon, travelling to the Moon has been the dream of many scientists and others for centuries. It is a funny thing that fate chose the film for the purpose of bringing the rocket from the realm of theory to the world of practice. When in 1929 Fritz Lang directed the UFA film, Woman in the Moon, he engaged Professor Obert as a consultant. It was my task to explain how it looked on the moon, how a space rocket would have to look like and how it would work. I succeeded in interesting Mr. Lang in the rocket tests. I told him that it would be of immense publicity value for his film if at the same time we could launch the first liquid fuel rocket. I was given money by UFA but it was already too late to do anything reasonable. The only thing I could do in the short time available to me was to make a rocket jet actually burn. So the first European liquid fuel rocket motor was not produced in one of the large industrial enterprises with technical resources, but in a film studio. An improvement to this construction finally resulted in the rocket combustion chamber with circular cooling provided by the fuel itself. It became a principle in rocket construction. One of Obert's assistants, the right one in the photo, Werner von Braun, an 18-year-old high school graduate who today is a well-known rocket technician in the United States. Twelve years later, this student of Obert brought about the realization of his researches and inventions when he fired the first large rocket, the V-2. Experts mention about 80 suggestions and inventions made by Hermann Obert which were utilized in the construction of the V-2.
After the war, a vast research program was established in America on the basis of the V-2. And so this rocket became the predecessor of the carrier rockets for the artificial Earth satellite and for intercontinental projectiles. The Redstone is the immediate successor of the V-2. It is a mediums-range rocket, and its production started quite some time ago. A slightly modified Redstone was later built as the first stage of the Jupiter C rocket, which took the first American satellite into orbit around the Earth. Together with other American and Russian altitude rockets and artificial satellites, it proved the correctness of Obert's ideas and theories on space navigation. The journey to the moon is no longer a dream. It is a serious program which reached the second stage of its development with the start of the Pioneer. There are many people today who do not realize yet the possibilities offered by space navigation. Space navigation is not at all as useless as it may first seem. I am thinking, for example, of the fixed orbit station, which would circumnavigate the Earth in the course of one sidereal day, and thus always float over the same point on the Earth's surface. A station could be utilized for reflecting ultra-short waves, centimetric waves, radiated from the Earth over the entire globe. It would be ideal for television. I wish to mention another example, the space mirror. Large mirrors made of tin foil could be positioned up in space. They could be used for the lighting of large towns during night hours, or to keep the ice away from the harbors of northern Siberia and Canada during the winter. Icebergs could be our weather. The value of many a subject of research can only be really determined after it has been completed. The research work and inventions of Hermann Obert were recognized in America, whereas his fundamental publication on rockets was rejected in Germany as a thesis. Even if many of his future projects are beyond the comprehension of laymen and experts, we should remember that our present-day achievements were only dreams yesterday.